Good morning, GCC. We are so excited that you decided to join us this morning for service. We hope that everyone had a wonderful Christmas and we wanted to wish you a very happy New Year's. Although this morning might look a little different, we are still very excited to experience church with you and we have some great news. Everything is on schedule for us to be back in person next Sunday, January the 8th. Let's start off the new year right with some worship. I 
keep finding You keep giving Keep providing I have all that I need You are all that I need I keep praying You keep moving I keep praising You keep proving I have all that I need You are all that I need I have all that I need You are all that I need There's honey in the rock Water in the stone Manna on the ground No matter where I go I don't need to worry Now that I know Everything I need You've got There's honey in the rock Purpose in your plan, power in the blood, healing in your hand. Started flowing when you said it is done. Jesus, who you are is enough. There's honey in the rock. 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 Oh, how sweet. How sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. God, thank you for this time that we have together. God, thank you that uh, even though we're not in a building uh, this morning, that we can all be together and we can worship you and we can sing out to you, whether we're in our car, whether we're at home, whether we're at work, uh, we're here together. um, And we thank you for that. God, I pray for the rest of the service. Pray for Grayson. And uh, God, we just love you. It's in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. And I know this is not how we envisioned to start off the New Year's by doing this, by not being able to meet together. It's a weird thing for all of us, but we can still have church no matter where we're at. And so I'm so excited to be able to give you guys a a message today that I believe God has given me, that God has laid on my heart and he's really been teaching me over the last couple months. In case you don't know, my name is Grayson Williams, and I'm on staff here at GCC. I'm the middle school student pastor, and many of you may know my wife, Taylor. She sings with our worship team, and Taylor and I, a couple months ago, welcomed our first child, Xander. And before I get going with my message today, I want to give you all a little more insight into my family. Taylor and I have been married now for two years, and we don't have a home. Well, at least we don't have our own home. You see, Taylor and I have lived in an apartment and lived in other places where we rent, but have never had our own place. But one day, we'll be able to have our own home and be able to say, there's no place like home. And I'm sure y'all would agree with that statement. Our homes are special to us. It's our safe place. It's our getaway. It's our own little fortress. Home is a place we can go to when everything around us is falling apart. However, in some cases, home is a place we don't want to go to. Whether it's the people inside or it's us, home is not a place we want to be at. And in today's story that we're going to look at, you'll see how one person enjoyed coming home, was able to come home, was able to celebrate coming home, And you'll see another side of the story where another person didn't want to go in the home, didn't want to be a part of what was happening inside the home. The story I want us to look at this morning involves a home, two brothers, and a loving father. This story is about coming home, coming home to celebrate. So let's pray and let's jump right into the story. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for allowing us to be able to meet wherever, to be able to have church wherever, God. So thankful for that. And so God, I ask today, as we look at your word, I pray that you will open our hearts and open our ears to be able to hear what you have given us and what you're trying to tell us, God. We love you. 
Thank you for everything. Ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is surrounded by all kinds of people. He has the Pharisees, the religious leaders, there's tax collectors, there's sinners, and there's outcasts. And since Jesus has their attention, he wants to address something. The way he does it is by telling three stories, or also parables. The first parable is about a lost sheep being found. The second parable is about a lost coin being found. And the last parable is probably Jesus' most famous parable that he ever told. It's the parable of the lost son. Or you may know it by another name, the prodigal son. Prodigal is a word that we don't really use today. Essentially, a prodigal is someone who is wasteful. And even though the title only mentions one son that's wasteful, there's another son, and he too was wasteful. So let's look into the story a little bit more. So there was a father who had two sons. One day, the younger son told the father that he wanted wanted his share of his inheritance now. Essentially, what he is telling his father is this. I don't want to wait around for you to die, so just go ahead and give me my share now. What was weird was that most of the time, the inheritance wasn't given until after the father had died. And you would think in this story, the father would tell the son, hey, I'm not dead yet, so I'm not giving you your share yet. But in a surprising move, the father agrees and gives the inheritance to both sons. So with more money than he could ever imagine, the younger son leaves home and goes to a far distant country. He had freedom finally. And now he could do whatever he wanted with whoever he wanted. I'm sure he started making some new friends who really liked him for him and not all the money he had. He had it all. He had the freedom. He had money. He had these new friends. He could finally be what he wanted to be since he wasn't home anymore. He could do whatever he wanted. He had no one else telling him what to do. He could make his own rules and live however he wanted to. However, in a blink of an eye, all that money he had was gone. Just like that. And to make matters even worse, this country that he was in experienced a great famine. So here he was in this far country with no food, no money, no family. And those friends that he had made, those new friends, were long gone. And his stomach began to growl louder than it has ever growled before. He was desperate for food desperate, starving. And so he goes and he looks for jobs to be able to maybe make a little bit of money or maybe the person who hired him would pay him in food just so he could survive. He comes across a farmer who is looking to hire someone to help around the farm, take care of the different animals. But the son has to persuade the farmer to hire him. And who knows why? Maybe because this farmer didn't know who this person was. It was this stranger coming in. Maybe he looked weird. Maybe he looked different. But whatever the case may be, he persuaded the farmer. And the farmer hired him. But the farmer didn't give him just any position. The farmer gave him the lowliest position a person could have at the time. Which was known as a hired servant. So... What was his job at the farm? To take care and feed the pigs. And you see what's, what's crazy about this, and if you were one of the people listening to the story, maybe one of the Pharisees or the religious leaders, the story, the son is probably a, a Jewish boy. And in the culture, in the Jewish culture, pigs were one of the most unclean animals. And so Jews stayed far, 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 far away from pigs. And so when these Pharisees and the religious leaders are hearing that this son 
had to work with the pigs just to be able to survive, they knew that this son had really, really lost it all, had hit rock bottom. And so as he was feeding the pigs and taking care of the pigs, his hunger didn't go away. And the food that the pigs were eating, he started looking at it like it was a five course meal, this super great meal that would fill him up and satisfy him. The only thing is the food that these pigs were eating couldn't be digested by humans. But that's how desperate he was. That's how hungry he was for just something to eat. This son had really hit rock bottom. He had it all, and then in a moment, it was all gone. While he was on rock bottom, he began to think about home. And the Bible says that he came to his senses. He began to think back about his life there and how great it was there and how he was taken care of. And he even realized that the servants, same positions that he was in with the pigs, they were taken care of. They were fed well. And so he decides, I'm gonna go back home. He makes a plan. He, he works through everything, every detail that he needs to do. He works about apologizing to his father and how he's going to do that. So he packs everything that he has and starts the journey back home. He knew if he goes back home, just maybe, just maybe this fa his father would hire him and allow him to come work at the father's house, doing whatever. That's how desperate the son was. That the only way he knew to survive was to go back home. Let's look and see what happens when this son gets back home. And Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 20, says, So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Verse 22. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. What a moment between this father and this son. Before the son even made it home, the father sees him and takes off running. It says the father saw him coming, which I take to mean that he had been waiting and looking for a long time for this son, this lost son of his, to come back home. And when he sees his son coming, before the son even gets anywhere close to home, he starts running. He starts running to his son. And when he gets to his son, he hugs and he kisses his son over and over. The reason that the running and hugs and kisses are a big deal is because during that time, Jewish fathers didn't really show that kind of emotion. They didn't show it in private. They definitely didn't show it in public. And so for this to happen, it's a big deal, not only to the son, but maybe to anybody else who's watching this interaction happening between this loving father and his son. So the son starts his apology, but before he could even finish, the father interrupts him. The father calls for his servants to bring the best robe, the best sandals for his feet, and the best ring for his finger. Those three things indicate that the father had totally forgiven his son and accepted him back. And to top it off, the father has the fattened calf killed for his son so they could really celebrate him coming home. His son was lost, but now was back home. Isn't this story great? You have a son and father being reunited. You have forgiveness happening and a party being thrown. However, like I mentioned in before, there's another son in this story and he's about to come into play. 
While the party was beginning, the older son was doing what he always did, working the fields. He had responsibilities that needed to be done. He couldn't slack off. So he finished his work for the day and begins to head home after a hard day's work. Before he makes it home, he starts to hear commotion coming from the house. As he gets closer, he hears the music. He hears people dancing and celebrating. He wonders what's going on, confused what's going on, what's happening. He sees one of the servants and asks what's what's going on. And the servant exclaims, your brother is back. Your father wanted to celebrate him being home, so we've killed that calf we have been fattening and we're having a huge party. The older son couldn't believe it. Instantly, he was filled with anger, not just towards his brother, but also to his father. He was dumbfounded at what his father was doing. He couldn't be a part of this party. He couldn't stand with what his father was doing. So he refused to go in. One of the servants must have told the father that his oldest son wasn't going to be joining the party. And so the father wants both of his sons in the home celebrating. So he goes outside to try to convince the oldest son to come in. The father is trying his best for his son to come in, but the son is having nothing to do with it. He says to his father, after all these years of doing everything you said to do and working nonstop, this is how you repay me? You never threw a party for me and my friends, but then this wild son of yours comes back home after wasting everything and you give him a party? You decide to throw this big, huge celebration for him? The father lets his oldest unleash on him and lets him get everything off his chest. After the son finishes, the father tells him that he has always been by his father's side and that everything that the father has is his as well. And in verse 32, the father says this, we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. And with that last statement from the father, Jesus ends the story. And all of those people who were around Jesus listening to him tell these stories are left hanging. They have no idea what happens. And Jesus did this on purpose. Jesus always has a purpose with his stories and how he shares them. They're probably thinking to themselves, did the older son go in? Did the younger son stay home for good or did he leave again? And why did this father throw a party for this wasteful son? Jesus doesn't answer any of these questions, and he lets the listener come to their own conclusion based on what happened in the story. And remember those different types of people who are listening to the story, well, they're represented in the story. The younger son represents the sinners, the outcasts, the prodigals. And the older son represents the Pharisees, and the religious teachers. And even though Jesus didn't finish the story, it probably doesn't take much for those people to see who they are in the story. The sinners, outcasts, and the prodigals are full of hope because they realize that they too can come home. And the Pharisees and the religious are full of anger because they realize who is going to be in the home and refuse to be in the same home as those people. So there's the story of the prodigal son. It's a great story with a lot of great lessons from it. And over the past couple of months, as I've been thinking about this story and working on this story, there's been a couple of things that came to mind about what I wanted to share with y'all, what we can learn from this story. And I believe there's two things in this story that we can learn. And it's for each group prodigals and the religious. If you're the prodigal, if you found yourself being wasteful, if you found yourself lost, you don't know what to do, God wants you to come home. If you have addictions, He wants you to come home. If you have more failures than you can count, He wants you to come home. If you've wasted it all, He wants you to come home. 
And see, that's the great thing about our God, is that no matter what you do, or where you're at, or how long you've been gone, or how long you've been wasting your life, God wants you to come back home. And if you're the religious, God wants you to come in the home. If you've always done the right things, but with the wrong intentions, He wants you to come in. If you've been a box checker, but you're just going through the motions, He wants you to come in. And if you've been wasteful towards the prodigals, He wants you to come in as well. And what I mean by coming in is being able to come in and associate and be around those sinners, those outcasts, those prodigals, to accept them because God has accepted them. God has forgiven them. And that's what God wants us to do towards the prodigals. He wants us to come in and to share time with them, to be with them. Not to look them with disgust, but to look to them with love and care because that's how he looks at them. So God wants to celebrate with both groups of people, with the prodigals and with the religious. He wants both in his home to celebrate. And so guys, for today, what I want you to do, wherever you're at, is I want you to take a moment and talk to God. If you're the prodigal who needs to come home, talk to God about coming home. And if you're the religious, talk to God about coming back in the home. And I'm telling you this, guys, this is what God wants. God wants both groups to come together to celebrate. So don't miss this opportunity to talk to Him, to ask Him for forgiveness. Don't miss it. Come home. No matter who you are, come home. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come home, God. And I pray that the whoever's watching this, God, the prodigals, the religious, I pray that they talk to you, God, and they come home. That they don't waste this moment, this opportunity, and that they come home because there's forgiveness in the home, there's love in the home, and there's no reason to be ashamed. We love you, God, and thank you for everything that you do in our lives. Thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy, and thank you for your love. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We love you. We hope you guys have a great New Year's Day, and we can't wait to see you.